So what I what this demonstration is about is to show you how easy it is to create a 2D model. This demonstration is really geared towards people who haven't done 2D modeling yet or just maybe tried it once or twice, okay? And so if you've done some 2D model RAS, this is just gonna be a review for you. But it's really, so this demo is really geared towards the new people in the class. And so here I've got a, a RAS model. Only thing I've done so far is I said, file new projects. So I already did that, I got a project. And I haven't created any geometry or anything. So I'm gonna go into RAS Mapper and we're gonna walk through the steps. So here I am in RAS Mapper and there's nothing, okay? So the very first step is to go to project and set your projection. So you have to have a spatial projection, okay? So this editor is gonna come up and there's a plot for a projection file. So I'm gonna hit this button to go out and find a projection file. And I happen to have one stored in the terrain. And it's a state plane projection file. Now it has to be an ArcGIS proje projection file, okay? And then we're just gonna say, okay, that's the first step. You gotta do that first. Do that before creating any terrain or anything, set that projection file. Well, the next step is we gotta have a terrain model to do any 2D modeling. So we're gonna create a terrain. So we're gonna say create a new terrain and up comes this editor. And I'm not gonna go through the details of this editor because Ra um, Cam's gonna go through the details of this editor in a, in a whole lecture. But basically I'm gonna add some files that are out on my machine. I'm gonna add, I have two, two terrain files and one's just a general, um, terrain for the whole area, but the other one is a, a channel model that I made from a 1D RAS model that, that's from what was 1D surveyed cross sections. And I want the channel part of it, the channel only to trump the regular terrain. So I have it on top, okay? And then I'm just gonna go ahead and say create terrain. And again, Cam's gonna go through this editor in detail. So don't worry about understanding everything that I'm doing. That's not the point of this. Um, you'll get the details. So there it is, there's the terrain, okay? And if you see, we're gonna work in this area, but this channel is a separate model, terrain model that was created from 1D cross sections. Then this rest of this terrain was just a DEM, a five meter, uh, I think it's five foot cells, okay. Okay, now what I like to do before I create the 2D area, and I, you don't have to do it this way, but what I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna create a land cover layer that I'm gonna use for Manning's end values. So I'm gonna go over, to, um, excuse me, RAS mapper and hit map layers, right click, create a new RAS layer and say land cover layer. And again, that same type of editor comes up for a terrain where I can add files. And here I'm gonna add, first thing I'm gonna add is actually um, a national land cover data set from the USGS that I have. I have the 2016 national land cover data set for the whole country. It's not that big. Okay, you, so you can download it for the entire US, okay? In addition to that, I'm gonna add a shape file that I have that was drawn in RAS um, in the area that we're working in, but I want the shape file to be on top so it trumps the national land cover data. So I'm gonna click on it and I'm gonna move it up. Okay, there's the national land cover data set. It has various classifications and then my Shape file that we created just has you know six that were drawn by hand. So this is the data we're gonna to combine together to make a land cover data set. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit create. And it's done. And then there it is. So um, if I open up the map layers, there's my land cover. And if I move around, I can see that in the outer area, I have this national land cover data set and it's showing me that's you know, developed medium density and low intensity. Okay, but inside I drew some polygons. So here I have a park, here I have a building, here I have another building. I wanted these larger buildings on purpose so I could define separate parameters for the buildings, like really high end values. Okay, so there's my land cover data set. Now, the channel is going right through here and the national land cover data sets do a horrible job. There is some open water, but then there's also, it says medium intensity urban right in the center of the channel. Well, we know there's not medium intensity urban right inside the channel, okay? So the, the accuracy of the national data set for channels is horrible. So one of the things you're probably gonna wanna do in RAS is create your own classifications for the land cover. So here, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna edit and I'm gonna create a polygon around what I consider to be the channel area. And I'm gonna call it main channel. So I'm creating my own last, 
classification called main channel. And I'm going to give it my, its own separate end values. Now, in a larger study, we might want to create multiple classifications in the channel so we can give them each separate end values. Okay. So as many places where you think the end value should be different in the channel, you'd create a separate polygon. We're just going to do one. So I'm going to go ahead and zoom in on this where we're going to do this. And I'm going to right click and I'm going to say edit layer. And I'm going to turn off the land cover because I'm going to I'm going to draw a classification along the main channel. Okay. Now this is going to take me a minute. I'm not going to do this super accurate like I normally would. And if you talk to Cam, he would tell you that I'm extremely anal about creating polygons along channels and it really is tough for me to do a, a bad job because and i hate it but we're going to try to do this quickly in interest of, of time so this is not going to be perfectly along aligned along the bank because it would take too long and we're just trying to demonstrate here now i'm left clicking to get a value and if i right click it recenters so i don't have to stop and click a different button or anything like that so I'm going to come out here. This area is going to be all wet, so I want it to be part of my channel and value. Recenter. And we're just going to go down to about here, and then I'm going to start going back. Cam or Gary, as you're doing this, even though you can do all of this in Raft Mapper, do you find that there's some Arc GIS tools that for like snapping that makes this um, maybe a little bit more accurate or would you recommend any tricks? I know you can do, you can digitize everything in RASMAPPER. We no longer need GIS, but is there some features that uh, that you find useful still using it to kind of clean things up with respect to polygons or break lines? No, well, I was just gonna say for me, I stay in RASMAPPER because I um, am just a, a, a part-time user of ArcGIS. So I'm, I'm actually way more comfortable using the tools in RAS Mapper, but Cam is a big time ArcGIS user, so let's get his perspective on that. So uh, my comment is we're never we're never going to be replacing the GIS. There's just too many tools and and uh, things about the GIS. Um, different GIS software has gotten much 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 more complicated every year, and it makes it a lot harder to jump in and just do something simple. And so we're trying to replace that that requirement. Um, we don't have snapping in uh, RAS Mapper right now. That's something we know we would like to have. Um, we do have clipping tools. So if you're trying to marry um, the edges of polygons, it's really easy. You can create your two polygons and then clip one and it'll throw away the overlapping area. So we do have that. So I don't think there's anything you you need in capital letters like need in the GIS. Um, but obviously if you're really great with a GIS, you probably can be a, a little bit faster over there. Okay, so I finished the polygon. I'm gonna call it main channel. Again, I would probably do lots of these for the channel and I might call it channel one, channel two, whatever. I'm gonna put in an end value already, which you can't, not any percent impervious because we're not gonna do infiltration and say, okay. So now if, when I zoom out, okay, and I'm gonna stop editing and I'm gonna save yes. So now when I, go over top of it, I see main channel, okay. The next step though, is we're gonna populate this thing with end values. And I'm just gonna put end values in here. Don't worry about the end values I'm putting them in. They're not gonna be accurate. I'm gonna try to make them reasonable, but don't hold me to these end values. You know, they're just to, for a demonstration, okay. So we got open space, maybe 035. We got a building. Now a building I am gonna talk about, I'm gonna put in an end value of 100 for a building. And the reason is I don't want water to be able to go through a building. So if I have an end value of 100, even though I don't have the physical building in there, water's going to come up and it's going to hit that end value of 100. It's going to go around it, and some's going to slowly seep in, which is kind of what happens with a building. As you're putting that in, I've got a quick question on the channel end value. So we all know that the end value changes quite a bit in channels depending on vegetation, et cetera. Um, I would assume you would put in multiple polygons to define different in values within that channel is that a correct statement so the the good thing is in this classification even if you don't in the classification um later on you'll see for each geometry you can actually create what are called n value override polygons so if later on when you go to calibrate you realize you need more n values you can make additional polygons per geometry and you can override the n values for those polygons anywhere so here i'm trying to do a good job in the main classification to get a good base but when I go to calibrate, I'm going to want to adjust end values everywhere. So I'm going to use those override polygons. 
So I can either make lots of channel polygons here if I want, which is a great idea, or I can do them later, or I can just use the override polygons for adjusting multiple ones up and down percentage wise. Okay, so there's my end values and I'm done. So now when I move over, not only do I see the land classification, but I see the end values. So there's my building of 100, medium density 06, uh, trees 06, et cetera. Okay. Do you guys use a specific report for your end values for the NLCD layer? Do you, like with, um, cause I know they vary depending on like, so there's some um, guidelines on end values in the RAS hydraulic reference manual for different types of land cover and land use. Um, mm -hmm. But they're just starting values. When you go to calibrate, these are not, even the, any guidelines you find anywhere are only gonna be starting values and you're gonna have to adjust them when you go to calibrate to events, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's it for the land cover. Now, let's go ahead and create a geometry. So I'm gonna actually right click on geometry and you can add a new geometry right in RAS Mapper. You don't have to go back to the geometry editor. So I'm gonna say new geometry and I'm just gonna call it base geometry, geometry data, okay? And then I'm gonna turn on um, the 2D area and specifically the perimeter and I'm gonna right click and say edit geometry. So now I'm gonna draw a 2D floor area perimeter. And again, I'm gonna zoom in down here, okay? And I'm gonna turn off the land cover data for a second. Now I'm gonna, there's a road here. I'm gonna start my 2D area right along this road as the upstream end, okay? And I'm just gonna make it kind of big. I'm, I wanna make sure it encapsulates all the water. So I'm gonna go to high ground in this area because I don't, I don't wanna have to redraw this 2D area. Now I'm gonna come up here I'm not gonna go way up this tributary because this is just an example, but we're gonna come down and we're gonna go over. And again, I'm on high ground at, at basically an elevation where I, I think, well, that the water's not gonna, now let's say I don't like that point I just drew. I'm gonna hit control Z and back up and go over here. And I can control Z as many times as I want. Okay, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna cut this off. I'm not gonna go too big with this. Um, it's just a demonstration. And we're gonna head back now to where we started. Again, I'm on high ground where water's not gonna to get to. And then I'm just gonna double click the last point and I'm just gonna call it um, 2D flow area. Now, once I name it, it automatically brings up the editor to create the mesh and RAS mapper. And it even automatically puts in a cell size of 100 by 100. That doesn't mean anything. It, it, that is not like the recommended cell size. Okay, that's just a default. The cell size should be, you need to think about what's the appropriate default cell size for the problem. And generally the way they do that, the way I do this is I use as the first cell size, like the largest cell size I'm gonna use, cause then I can add refinement regions to make smaller cell sizes in different places. But we're gonna go ahead and keep 100 and I'm gonna say generate computation points and close. And there it is, okay, there's my 2D flow area. Now, in addition to that, I need to add boundary conditions to this thing. So we're gonna go back over here. This is the upstream end. And then I'm gonna turn on um, the BC reference lines. And I'm already editing still. So I'm, I'm gonna be on the new, add a new feature, or not edit, but add a new feature. And boundary condition lines, we wanna draw left to right looking downstream. So the flow is going this way. And I just want the water to come through this roadway. So I'm gonna just, the boundary condition lines, the external ones we draw outside of the 2D area. Don't go inside at all. If you want it as an external boundary, you have to be outside the 2D area. So I'm gonna just start here and go to there. And I'm gonna call it upstream inflow, okay? Now I'm gonna move downstream and the way I'm moving downstream is I'm holding down the shift key to get a panning uh, icon and I'm moving down and I can use my, my center wheel to zoom in and zoom out. Now water's going this way. So I wanna draw from left to right looking downstream. So I'm gonna make this one larger because water can go out in this floodplain too. So I'm gonna say this boundary condition goes all the way up to here. And I'm gonna call that downstream outflow, okay? Okay, so now we're gonna stop editing and we're gonna save that data. So that's pretty much everything I wanna create for the 
the geometry in RAS Mapper. But before I leave, I need to associate with this geometry. I need to go up and right click on the geometry and say manage geometry associations. I need to associate the terrain I want to use and what I want to use for end values. Now, since there's only one terrain, it automatically defaulted to that terrain. But if I had more than one, I would pick the terrain I want to use with this geometry. And then for end values, I'd pick that land cover data set that I created. We're not doing infiltration, so I don't need an infiltration layer represented in previous, and we're not doing sediment, so I don't need those to associate with the geometry, just terrain and end values. Those are a requirement. You have to have terrain and end values to do 2D modeling. So we're gonna do that. Okay, so now I'm just gonna close RAS Mapper. Now I'm gonna open the geometry editor, and I'm gonna open that file that I just created in RAS Mapper, because you have before you can add boundary conditions, you have to have a geometry file opened, okay? So that lets RAS know, oh, you want to add flow boundary conditions with the currently open geometry file. So I've got this geometry file open. Now I can go to the unsteady flow data editor, either as edit unsteady flow data, or I can pick this button, which is the unsteady flow data editor. And what I want to do next then is I want to put in the boundary conditions that I created. So for the upstream inflow, we're going to use a flow hydraft. So I click on the cell for the upstream inflow, then I pick a boundary condition type. Notice not all the types are available because it already knows that it's a two-dimensional flow area boundary condition and there's only four types available. So I'm gonna pick flow hydrograph. Now here I'm gonna enter the data into a table and I'm gonna use hourly values and I'm just gonna make up a flow hydrograph. So I'm gonna start at 5,000 CFS and I'm gonna go for 12 hours and I'm gonna go to 20,000 CFS and then I'm gonna go to 36 hours and I'm gonna go back to 5,000 CFS. Now, RAS has this cool feature that says interpolate missing values. So I don't have to type them all in. It'll interpolate the rest. And if I want to look at that, I can say plot. And it takes a minute to load. And there's my hydrograph going from 5,000 to 20 and back to 5 over 36 hours. Now, one other thing you have to do for flow hydrographs with 2D is you have to give it a slope at where along the stream. You really want what's like a water service or energy slope. But the idea here is it needs a slope to use Manning's equation in order to figure out a water surface at that boundary condition and then to how to figure out how to distribute the flow amongst the cells along that boundary condition. So I'm, you're required to enter a water surface slope in that location of where the boundary condition is, okay? Now, you can use a terrain slope if you don't know the water surface as a, as a rough value, but after you start making runs, you might wanna go up and refine that. Okay, so that's all we need for the flow hydrograph. Now for downstream, um, we don't have a, a known flow or a known stage, okay? So we're gonna use Manning's equation or what's called normal depth, and it requires a slope also. And it, I'm gonna use the same slope in this case. And what it's gonna do here, it's gonna use the cross section that it extracts for that boundary condition line, and then Manning's equation in this N value, for any given flow, it's gonna compute a water service. And then from that water service, it's gonna figure out how much flow to take out of each cell along that boundary condition line. Now for initial conditions, I'm not gonna put any initial water service in this 2D area. I'm gonna leave it start dry, okay? So I'm gonna leave that blank. And then I'm gonna say file, save, unsteady flow. And let's just call this demo flood event. And so there we have it. We have terrain and geometry and we have flow. Now we need to create a plan like we always do in RAS. So I'm gonna come up here. Now you gotta run the geometric preprocessor and the unsteady flow. The post is only used for 1D, so we don't need that, okay? Um, so we can not worry about that, but I do need to put in a time window. So I'm just gonna use one that I did in, when I originally created this, pre-February 2021, starting at time zero. And I'm gonna go to four February. 2021 at time 12, so that's 36 hours of simulation because I only put in 36 hours of flow. I'm gonna use a 15 second time step. Why do you think I'm choosing 15 seconds? What do I know about this model already to give me some kind of judgment that I, I need the time step less than a minute maybe? Well, I know the cell size, right? What cell size did I pick? 100, 100, 100 foot. So normally in a flood, What's a typical velocity range in a channel? Three, four, five feet per second. Yeah, five feet per second, that's a good one. So at five feet per second, how fast does water go through 100 feet? 20 seconds, right? So if the velocity is faster than that, so I'm picking a time step that I know that's gonna be close to like the time it takes as water's gonna move through a cell. 
And I might have to make that smaller later on if I have some problems, but I might be able to get away with it bigger, but it's a starting value. Now for mapping output, I'm gonna do every 30 minutes. And then for my hydrograph output, I wanna be more detailed for hydrograph plots. So I'm gonna say every five minutes. Now this detailed output interval is only for post-processing for 1D modeling. Since there's no 1D model, I don't care about that. And then one other thing I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna go to the computational options. You're gonna get a whole lecture on this, so don't worry about it. There's a 2D flow tab, and there's this thing called initial conditions time. And I'm gonna set that as an hour. And what that does, it says run this 2D area for an hour with a, the inflow at 5,000 constant. And I'm just gonna do that to get water in through the channel, okay? So I'm gonna run that 5,000 for an hour to have water all the way through the channel before I actually start my event. So that's called a 2D initial conditions time. And then I'm gonna go ahead and save this plan. I'm gonna give it a name, call it demo flood run for the, you can give it a long title and then a short idea. I'm just gonna use the same thing. Okay, and that's it. So now I should be able to hit compute and it should run unless I made a mistake or I forgot some data. So it's gonna do some data checking first, but it looks like I didn't miss anything. So it's doing the pre-processing of the 2D area, that's done. And now it's running the model. Okay, and, and since we don't have a lot of cells, it's gonna go pretty quickly. All right, so that's done. I'm gonna close that. I'm gonna close these guys. I'm gonna go to RAS Mapper because that's the only place we can look at output for 2D other than the hydrograph plot. And I'm gonna turn on results and I have one plan, which we just created, and I'm gonna look at the depth. So this is the maximum depth that occurred during the event, but I can also click on depth and then I can animate that. So let's go ahead and animate that. Here's what happened during the event, okay. And I can bring that back and you know I can I can go through it more slowly. So maybe I wanna zoom in here and I can walk through it. So what do we think about this model? as it is. Do we think it's a detailed model? No, there's no break lines. There's no break lines. What about the channel? The overbanks are not well defined. The overbanks aren't defined. They're not defined at all, right? Because I don't have faces lined up with the banks, do I? So like in here, this water, let's back up. Watch what happens. This water, since I don't have faces lined up with the high ground of the channel, it has no knowledge of that high ground of the channel. So watch what happens to the water when it gets up high enough. It jumps out here. When there's really some high ground right through here that I should have aligned for the channel and had faces along so it wouldn't get out of the channel until it got high enough to go over that high ground. But because I don't have faces lined up with the banks of the channel, it has no knowledge of it. It only has knowledge of the terrain along the faces, okay? So here water can get into this cell Right here, water's getting into this cell. And because water's one elevation, well, this part of the cell is that low also, so it puts water out here. Well, if water can get here, it can cross this face and go to here. It can cross that face to go to there. Okay, it can cross this face and go to here. So that's the problem with this. If I don't have faces along the channel, I'm not respecting the high ground of the channel, and I do not have an accurate channel model at all. And as far as the overbanks, I don't have any brake lines respecting these roads and so forth. Now, I'm not gonna go through and create a detailed model, but I am gonna go show you how to quickly use a refinement region for the channel, because we can do that pretty quick. Okay, so let's go ahead and go back to our geometry and go to our 2D area and turn on refinement region. And be before I do that, I could draw this refinement region, but I've already drawn a, a channel polygon, didn't I? When did I draw a channel polygon? for the Manning's end, right? So one thing I can do is I can go down to my map layers and I know that I made a classification layer. So I'm gonna start editing this layer and I know I have a classification layer and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna select the channel polygon and then I'm gonna right click on this and say copy selected feature. So that copies that polygon into memory. So now I'm gonna come up to refinement region and I'm gonna say edit and now I'm just gonna right click and I'm gonna say paste feature. I'm gonna turn off the map layers. And lo and behold, now I have a refinement region polygon already in there, okay? I didn't have to draw it because I had already drawn it. Or if I had a shape file out there, I could import a shape file either way. So the next step though is to define the parameters of the refinement region. So I'm gonna right click on it. And I'm gonna say edit refinement region properties. 
and you give the refinement region cell size for the interior. I'm going to use 50 feet. But then you also give it a cell size along the perimeter. I'm going to use 50 feet along the perimeter. They don't have to be the same. I could have used 100 along the perimeter, 50 inside. Then there's this thing called near repeats. If you want to repeat the cell size along the perimeter, if I want to use 50 and then another 50, um, I'm going to go ahead and do one. Far spacing, if I leave it blank, it goes back to the nominal cell size of the 2D area, which is 100. So I'm going to leave it blank. And then this one cell protection radius says, if I have other refinement regions or break lines, near this don't screw up the cells along this refinement region make sure they stay intact so that's all a good thing so i'm going to say okay now i'm going to right click on it and say enforce the region and it actually makes the mesh now there's a couple of red dots and what it's saying is there's an error it says maximum of eight faces per cell so i have three locations where i have cells that have more than eight faces the easiest way to fix that is to add computation points so i'm going to click on computation points I'm going to zoom in, and sure enough, if I look, this cell has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine faces. So I'm simply going to add some new points, one here, maybe one there. Now that cell's fixed. So now I'm going to zoom back out, and I'm going to go over to the other two cells that have the same problem, and I'm going to add a computation point here and here, and then I'm going to come up to this cell. This one's got like 10 faces, so I'm gonna maybe have to add more than just a couple. Okay, it looks like I got it. And now if I zoom back out, um, there's no cells, no red dots, okay? And so I'm gonna stop editing, and I'm gonna save the edits. Okay, so that I've just added a refinement region to that 2D area. I'm not gonna go ahead, and, uh, the next step would be to add break lines in the interior. I'm gonna skip that step, so let's close this. I do want to open the RAS geometry editor so you can see there's the refinement region in the geometry. Now I'm going to go ahead and just run it. Now it's going to take a little longer to run because we added a lot more cells inside that channel. We're using 50 foot cells instead of 100 foot cells. Did you then, notice those RAS mapper like uh, wet spots that are outside the channel? Is that ever just from like a bug? Because I've had that before where I have like enforced the channel and they still give me like random spots that seem wet that shouldn't be wet. Well, again, it depends on how you align those faces. And if water can cross mm -hmm. a face and go to a cell, okay, that, that mm -hmm. so the, what's gonna, if in some case you, you might, because the train is sloping so much, the only way to get away with that would be to have really small cells. So it could go to one cell, the next, the next, the next. So there's gonna mm -hmm. be on some level, you don't, you're gonna have to live with some of that. You know what I'm saying? Is that yeah. like when water's just first leaving, yeah, it might be a little spotty right there. And you know that it really traveled overland continuously, but because the cells are larger and it only has one water source per cell, it can't show you that because there's not enough cells, okay? But if that's not really germane to the final problem, so what, right? Once you get to a higher flow and if that's covered, then you've got your right answer anyway. No, it's still accounting for the travel time through the cell. So don't, don't worry about that part of it, okay? Okay, so now we've got this more detailed model, and when I animate back in that area, I'm gonna see water coming out a little bit more nicely. Now here's where it did jump a little bit here, right? And again, it went into this cell, but because this is really steep sloping and it can only get one water service for this cell, the water can come into this cell, but the lowest point in the cell is here. And so it doesn't show it flowing down the cell because it can only have one water surface per cell. Does that make sense? So if I really wanted to see water water flowing down the steep terrain, I'd have to use really small cells. So there's going to be some limit where you're just going to have to live with some of that because the fact is only one water surface per cell. Now RAS Mapper is doing a sloping water surface through here. Let me make sure I have that turned on correctly. Yeah, I do. But there's only much it can so much it can do if the cells are too large. Okay. Now, is that gonna affect this answer in here though? Okay, let's, let's get this going further. Now I got some water in there. Is that gonna really affect my final answer of where the water went to and how high it got inside of here? Not really. Okay, that, that little you know, jump across that one cell, it's still accounting for water coming into the cell, filling and going out. So it's still accounting for travel time. It's just not mapping it as nicely for that overland flow across that steep train as you might like as what really occurs in real life. 
but the only way to get that would be to use really small cells. And if you start going at that level, you're going to have models with just tremendously large number of cells and take forever to run. And you're not going to get that much more benefit out of the final answer. So it's, it's a plus and minus type of thing. You've got to weigh the benefits to the, you know, how much extra uh, computation time it's going to take for that benefit. Okay, we can also look at velocities. I'm not going to look at a lot of output. There's going to be a whole lecture on output. But here's velocities in 2D. I'm going to turn off the, the geometry, okay? And we can see we can look at velocities. And I'm going to turn on water surface. And we can get water surfaces. Um, I can turn on the particle tracing. Uh, wait, you can't turn on particle tracing with max values. So you got to have like a that. And then I can speed up the particle tracing. I like turning on the particle tracing with velocity. And again, you can't turn on particle tracing at max because max is kind of the max velocity that occurred everywhere regardless of time. It's not an actual instant in time. So you can't do particle tracing unless it's an actual instant in time. Otherwise, the tracing won't be correct. So that's why we don't allow it for we're plotting maximums.